بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائه مجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح لله ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم له ملك السماوات والأرض يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو بكل شيء عليم هو الذي خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش يعلم ما يلج في الأرض وما يخرج منها وما ينزل من السماء وما يعرج فيها وهو معكم أينما كنتم والله بما تعملون بصير له ملك السماوات والأرض وإلى الله ترجع الأمور يولج الليل في النهار
Allahu Akbar Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Qul huwa Allahu Ahad Qul huwa Allahu Ahad Illahu Samad Lam Yalid Walam Yulad Walam Yakul Lahu Kufuan Ahad Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Qul huwa Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad Lam yalid wa lam yulad Wa lam yakun lahu kufuan ahad صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله الأطهار على رسول الله وآله الأطهار صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. The start of our series, I thought we'd start with the recitation of the Quran, and as some of you probably felt, how the Quran penetrates into our heart in a mesmerizing effect. It is indeed the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these specific verses I chose, the first six verses from Surah Al-Hadid and Surah Al-Ikhlas. Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen al-Sajjad alayhi salam was asked about Tawheed. He said, stick to these ayat and you'll be in the good. Of course, this was a good response to the people who asked him. There are many other ayat in the Quran about Tawheedullah Azza wa Jal, Dhikrullah Azza wa Jal. But it seems that the Imam, Salamullah Alayhi, per his judgment, he saw that for this particular group, this would be great. And if you notice the ayat in Surah Al Hadid, mention some of the attributes of Allah. سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Glorified Allah, whatever is in the heavens and in the earth. يعني everything does tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How they do tasbih, we don't understand. That part, we don't comprehend. Trees do tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does it mean that they have a mouth and they do tasbih through them? No, not necessarily. Not through necess Not necessarily. We know, for example, certain organisms, they ingest, but not through a mouth, through a process called phagocytosis, for example. They just engulf something and get it in. But they ingest. They have a method of ingestion, not similar to the human beings. But everything does tasbih of Allah. And he is indeed the honorable, the wise. He has the ownership, the true ownership of the heavens and the earth. لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ When we have a musibah, a problem, a calamity, what do we say? وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا What do they say? إِنَّا لِلَّهِ يعني we belong to Allah سبحانه وتعالى He is the ultimate owner. And therefore if he is the owner, خلص, we submit to what he says, what he does. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ and وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام He says إِنَّا لِلَّهِ إِقْرَارٌ بِالْمُلْكِ You are confessing that He is the owner, we are the slaves We are the servants of Allah وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ إِقْرَارٌ بِالْهُلْكِ يعني You are confessing that you are not going to last in this dunya He is the ultimate king 
He is the one who revives, takes lives away. Capable of doing everything and so on and so forth. Some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until we come to Surah Al-Ikhlas. As the name suggests, Surah Al-Ikhlas. Submission to Allah, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very briefly, if Allah gives us tawfiq tonight, inshallah, we'll discuss three main aspects about theology or tawheed in Nahjul Balagh from the Quranic perspective again. First, what is the importance and the significance of tawheed? Why is it important? Second, how can we, inshallah, strengthen our tawheed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And third, few points that we can do so that, inshallah, our iman in Allah increases. If Allah gives us tawfiq. First, the importance of tawheed. Why is tawheed important? On the day of the battle of Al-Jamal, on the day of the battle of Al-Jamal, an Arab man comes to Imam Ali alayhi salam on the day of the battle. And he says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, can we say Allahu Wahid? Do we say Allah is one? He's asking a theological question. The people around Imam Ali alayhi salam scolded this man. They told him, Don't you realize, don't you see with the day we're in? Don't you see how Imam Ali alayhi salam is preoccupied with the war? There's a war that's gonna about to happen here. A very big war. Imam Ali alayhi salam stopped them and he said, leave this man alone. What he's asking for is what we are asking of those people who are coming to fight against us. Yani if they understand Tawheedullah Azza wa Jal truly, they would not come to fight against me. Tawheed is very important. And then he explains to him. He says to say Allahu Wahid, one, God is one, it contains four meanings. Two that you cannot attribute to Allah and two that you can. The two that you cannot attribute to Allah is one in terms of numbers. You know, one, two, three, four. He says, don't you see how the Quran says that disbelievers are those who associate others with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or those who made him one of three, thalithu thalatha. That's not right. He's one. Two, the other one that we cannot say to Allah, he is one, meaning that he's one like us. Just like the rest of us. You know how sometimes a person comes and says, he's one of us. He's not one like us. So he says, those two you cannot mention. The two that you can attribute to Allah is meaning one, meaning unique, nothing like him. One, yes. He is one with nothing like him. Where did he get this from? The Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Laysa kamithlihi shay. In Surah Al Shura, there is nothing like Allah. Yani you cannot attribute things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is this important? If you read Sahih al Bukhari in the ayah, Wayawma naqulu li jahanna mahalim talati wa taqulu halmin mazid. On the day when we ask Jahannam, Are you full? And it says, Are there more? Give me more. We have plenty of room here. Come, welcome. So, they say, he narrates, Bukhari narrates, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take his foot, put it into Jahannam, and Jahannam will say, enough, ya Allah, enough. Allah, enough. That kind of a hadith we reject. Because Allah now has a foot. I was in the city of Medina a few years ago, during the season of Hajj. And I remember I was listening to the khatib in Masjid al-Nabawi, Sharif, the lecturer, he was talking. He said the day of Arafah is such a blessed day, it's a good day, it's a day of mercy. And to be honest with you, I was surprised, I was happy because for the first time, he's not talking about visiting the Qubur and it is shirk to go to the Qubur and it is haram to go to visit all. For once, he's saying something good, that the day of Arafah is a day of mercy, is a day of forgiveness, great. Then he adds this. And I heard him myself. He says, on that day, it is so great that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets up from his throne and descends down from the heavenly sky to the worldly sky. He comes down 
And he says, welcome my servants. Now, if that is Allah, if he gets up from the throne, now you've just made him analogous to the rest of us. Okay, so if he got up, then what is on the throne anymore? It's empty, it's vacant. If he descends down from the heavenly skies to the worldly skies, then who's left in the heavenly skies anymore? You see what I'm talking about? You cannot personify Allah. You cannot give him personal attributes, human attributes. Otherwise, anything that can be personified, anything that can be quantified, anything that can be felt, then it is confined in time and space. And that's why nothing is like Allah. Laysa kemithlihi shay. And that's what Imam Ali is saying. One with nothing like him. And then that's one. The second thing is, he says, one that cannot be divided into parts. And he says that's the meaning of ahad. When you say ahad, there is difference between wahid and ahad. Qul huwallahu ahad. Ahad means cannot be divided into parts. He is one that cannot be divided into parts. What do we mean by this? Well, first of all, easy example, us humans, we are made up of parts, We're made up of arms, legs, eyes, etc., etc. These are all limbs that you put them together, they make a human being, for example. Allah is not like this. That's one second thing. Second, us as human beings, you may have a human being, for example, who has knowledge. He's a doctor, he's an engineer, he's an IT, he's whatever it is. Was he born as a doctor? Was he born as an engineer? He gained this knowledge. It means this knowledge was acquired. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his knowledge is not acquired. His knowledge is inherent. It is of him. He does not gain knowledge. He is the source of knowledge, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a difference between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One that is not made up of parts. And therefore, when we say Allah is alim, Allah is basir, sami', he's all hearing, all seeing, it's, we're not talking about different facets of Allah. No, it's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just different names that he has given to himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's very important. If Tawheed is there, people then can understand it. Then they would not have come to fight against Imam Ali. Whereas we see the people of the Khawarij, the Khawarij, they come, they say the Quran, they read the Quran, they pray their Salat, and they come to fight against Imam Ali alayhi salam. It means they have not understood the essence of Tawheedullah Azza wa Jal. On the other example, Imam Ali alayhi salam asks one of his companions, his name is Rashid al-Hujari. Rashid, one of the close companions of the Imam. He says, how about you when the sinner of Bani Umayyah, referring to Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad, captures you and he asks you to disassociate yourself from me. minni. What would you do? He said, I won't do it. He said, then he will kill you. He's going to cut off your arms, legs, and tongue. He said, when he does that, would I go to Jannah? Yani when all that happens, will my faith still be strong? And I'm going to end up in Jannah? He said, you are with me in dunya and in the akhirah. And tama'i fi dunya wal akhirah. What a beautiful thing. He said, then, khalas, then I don't care. Whatever he does, he does. And indeed, he was captured. He was captured one day. And Ubaidillah bin Ziyad told him, disassociate from Imam Ali alayhi salam. He said, I won't. He said, how did he tell you I was going to kill you? What did he tell you? He said, he told me you're going to cut off my arms and my legs and my tongue. He said, I'm going to prove to you he's a liar. I will cut off your arms and legs, but I keep your tongue. So he cut off his arms and his legs. They took him home. His daughter narrates, Rashid's daughter. She said, when my father came home, now imagine, just lost arms and legs. And this is not like, you know, a surgical amputation with anesthesia, you know, and he's, now with the sword. He comes home, look at the determination, look at the aqidah. When the aqidah is strong, when the belief is strong, the faith is strong. He calls his people, 
he calls the people, he says, come, let me dictate to you what Imam Ali alayhi salam has dictated to me, what he has told me. I'll dictate to you. Now, this is my final moments. Write down the knowledge that Imam Ali alayhi salam has given me. So they brought papers and pens or the equivalent of papers and pens and they started writing. He's dictating. He's telling them in that state, in that state, they're writing, they're writing until some of the spies go to Ubaidillah bin Ziyad. They said, you cut off his arms and legs, but you kept his tongue. He's still talking to the people. He's lecturing them. So he says, then cut off his tongue. So then they cut off his tongue, Radwanullah ta'ala alayh, which proved that who was the liar? He told him, I'm going to prove that your imam is a liar. He turned out to be the one. Just like the imam said. So when they cut off his tongue, he died. This is the aqeedah. You can see how important it is to have the aqeedah. So that's there. Because it is so important, brothers and sisters, it is important to also maintain a strong aqeedah. In this day and age, especially this age of media being so fastly propagated, we have a lot of people who claim themselves to be atheists. And they are getting a lot of platforms. And therefore, unfortunately, a lot of our youth and people, in fact, they are being influenced by some of their arguments. They listen to them and they say, ah, this makes sense. And unfortunately, they're being influenced by some of these arguments. What's also driving this is some of those atheists, they themselves are professors in universities. And unfortunately, we sometimes think that just because someone is a professor at the university, they know everything. And that is not true. Let me tell you something. Now, we respect, of course, people of science, people of knowledge. Jazakumullah khaira. Thank you. May Allah bless you. However, within the field, within your field of science or whatever it is, great. Even within the field. I remember I did my first PhD in chemistry on kidney stones, brothers and sisters. I attended a conference one day on kidney stones. All the people there were professionals on kidney stones. A person, a group comes up and they're talking about how they originate. There is still debate on how they form, how they form. One group comes up, one professors at universities and they claim that it forms this way and they bring the evidence and the proof. He gets up, he gets down, another professor gets up, another professor. He brings evidence and proof that no, it's not this way, it's this way. Okay, so who's right, who's wrong? Both are experts in the field. Both are professors, researchers, doctors, and they publish papers on this field. One says this way, one says this way. Interestingly, I published a paper later. I, I showed both of them are correct. It's actually both ways. This is right and this is right. That's where the whole debate is originating from. What I'm saying is people in the same field, within the same field, sometimes they differ about the field itself, they have differences of opinion. So imagine now if these guys, these professors would talk about theology. This is not their field. This is something completely different. But we think that just because someone is a professor, خلاص, he or she knows everything. I'll give you one example for the sake of brevity. There is a professor by the name of Cross. Lawrence Cross, K-R-A-U-S-S. He's published a book. The title of his book is A Universe from Nothing. Bestseller. Sold millions of copies. This book is introduced by Richard Dawkins, a famous atheist, or he himself calls sometimes himself agnostic, not atheist. So he says, Richard Dawkins, he says, with this book, he, this cross, has sealed the argument that there is a God. Khalas, no more argument. I was curious. Okay, let's read this book. See what this guy is talking about here. Listen to what he says. Now, are you guys awake with me, inshallah? You're awake? Okay. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, 
He says on page 149 of the book, first, I want to be clear about what kind of nothing I am discussing at the moment. A universe from nothing. So he needs to define what is nothing. Listen to his definition. This is the simplest, simplest version of nothing, namely empty space. For the moment, I will assume space exists, exists with nothing at all in it and that the laws of physics also exist. Space exists and the laws of physics exist. Does that sound like nothing to you, brothers and sisters? That sounds like a lot of things to me. A lot of things are in existence here. How could, this is like, you know, I don't know if you guys know English, but there's something called an oxymoron. You know, something like contradictory. He says nothing and he says exists. How could you have nothing and existence at the same time? Okay. Now, interestingly, so this is what he says. On page 170 of the same book, he admits, he says the following. After, you know, going through his arguments and so on and so forth. So page 170, he says, does this prove that our universe arose from nothing? Of course not. But it does take us one rather large step closer to the possibility of such a scenario. The possibility of such a scenario. Yani, he's himself saying, does this prove that our universe arose from nothing? He answers himself, of course not. Jazakallahu khaira. If you're saying, of course not, then that's it. And the other person in the introduction says, this is the be all and the end all. Khalas, it's done. Are you serious? So interestingly, there is um, an author, a researcher. His name is Kelly James Clark. This researcher wrote a book called Religion and the Sciences of the Origins. Of Origins. Religion and the Sciences of Origins. He states, this person, he is kind of responding to Cross. He's answering Cross. What does he say? He says, Cross's definition of nothing transforms into something. Again, he's free to define words as he likes. You can say whatever you want. It's a free country. Okay. He's free to define words as he likes. But it sure seems like he's cheating. A paragraph after he calls space empty, which we call, he defines as a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles and fields widely fluctuating in a magnitude. He calls it otherwise empty space. All this stuff is empty space. In the next paragraph, he says that the universe results from these quantum fluctuations in what is essentially nothing. So all that stuff is nothing. Did you see, brothers and sisters? This book of his is a bestseller. He's a professor of physics. Many people have read this book and they're getting influenced by this book. But unfortunately, you really boil it down. What This is what the Quran refers to as van, van. It's just doubts, basically, speculations. He's just basing his whole argument on speculations. And unfortunately, a lot of people are following this argument based on this speculation. Richard Dawkins himself, in 2012, you can find the interview online. He met, he had an interview with the Archbishop of Gatonsbury. And the, the Archbishop asked him, on the scale of zero to seven, where zero, you're a very firm believer. Seven, you're a complete disbeliever, atheist. Where do you rank yourself? He says 6.9. He asked him, why 6.9? You, after all your books, he has so many books against Wal-Iyadu Billah religion, against Allah Wal-Iyadu Billah. All this, and 6.9, why 6.9? Why not 7? He says, because I cannot conclusively prove that God does not exist. Can you imagine? SubhanAllah. And I have seen people, I have come across people, unfortunately, 
Muslims, Shia, who have been influenced by his books and unfortunately have deviated from religion. And at the end of the day, what does he himself say? I cannot really prove it 100%. So what is he acting on? Van. Van. Speculation. Speculation. You see, brothers and sisters? Whereas if the aqidah is strong, one can then affirm his belief. Affirm. That's why Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha says, Naumun ala yaqeen. To sleep while you are certain of the truth is better than praying, getting up, salatun fi shak, like the khawarij. The khawarijas get up and pray, but they have doubt. They don't understand the Quran. They're not really understanding the essence of religion and theology. And hence they come to fight against me and they want to kill me. And indeed they killed him at the end of the day. Abdul Rahman ibn Mulja. They killed Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah alayhi. See brothers and sisters. So Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah alayhi says in the first khutbah of Nahjul Balagha. Awwalu al-deen ma'rifatuh. The essence of religion is recognizing Allah. Recognize him. وَكَمَالُ مَعْرِفَتِهِ التَّصْدِيقُ بِهِ After you recognize him, then believe in him. يعني don't be in denial. Do not be in denial. Once you can see there is a, a God, and, and that's something important in our faith, in our faith as Shia, followers of Ahlul Bayt, usul al-deen for us can be proven through logic, through logic and reason. That's why I... One time I remember I was here and I mentioned this story to you, brothers and sisters. In 2014, I was invited to the University of Alberta to talk to a professor of philosophy who's an atheist. I told him, I said to him, I did research on diabetes and heart failure for a few years. 80% of diabetic patients die from heart failure. I have a cardiologist here to kind of fact check me, you know, so I better watch my, uh, my, my facts are right, inshallah, or good, alhamdulillah, good. So 80% of diabetic patients die from heart failure. And so researchers around the world are trying to find out why. So they do a lot of research. Billions of dollars are invested on this. There are conferences they attend every year specifically about this. Cardio cardio diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So... I told him, imagine if one day at one of those conferences, at one of these conferences, a man gets up. All these professors, doctors, you know, all those guys, researchers. He says, I figured it out. All you guys have been just wasting your time and billions of dollars and money on this. The reason why 80% of diabetic patients die from heart failure is because of a random process of evolution. That's it. So why bother? I told him, will these professors and researchers accept that argument? It's just a random process of evolution. That's it. Will they accept it? He paused. I told him if scientists, I told him I'm going to speak to you as a scientist, not a man of faith, just as a man of science. If scientists cannot accept that 80%, a heart can fail through a random process. A heart cannot fail through. There must be a reason why. So they're trying to figure it out. If as a scientist, I cannot accept that a heart can fail through a random process, how do you want me then as a scientist to believe that this whole universe with all its chemistry and its physics and its laws and with all the perfections that it has just came in through a random process? His response, because he was a professor of philosophy, so he's a scholar of philosophy, of logic, a completely logical argument. I did not use an ayah from the Quran or a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi or the ahl. Logical. He said, well, maybe we do not understand the source. Ah, wait a minute. What did he just admit? That there is what? A source. He just confessed. But we don't understand. We're not talking about understanding the source. Our discussion right now is about what? The existence of a source. And you just confessed that there is a source. You want to call him a source, you want to call him whatever you want to call him, we'll call him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, brothers and sisters, 
when that logic is there, it's, that's why Imam Ali alayhi salam says the beginning, the essence of religion is to recognize him. And don't be in denial. Don't Once you recognize him, believe in it. Khalas, believe in him. And the essence of the belief in him is tawheeduh. Now he's one. There is no partners, associates with him. He doesn't have any partners or associates. No children. And that's what Ayat Surah Al-Ikhlas tells us. Qul Allahu ahad. He is not divided into parts. Allahu samad, needless. He does not need anything, nor does he need anyone. Sufficient by himself. Al Ghani. We are the poor. We are in need of Allah. He does not need anything. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He did not give birth, nor was he given birth to. Yani he was eternal. He's eternal. He's always in existence. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan. I had no match is equivalent to Allah. Yani don't attribute arms and legs and face and whatever to Allah. Human attribute, nothing, nothing can be attributed to Allah in that context. Something physical. Don't make him into physical. And that's why he, salamullah alayhi, says, وَكَمَالُ تَوْحِيدِهِ نَفْيُ الصِّفَاتِ عَنْ Don't give him attributes like human attributes, like what we read in Sahih al-Bukhari. He has a leg or a foot that he puts into the fire. That is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, we find the importance of tawheed. Once we have a good aqidah, a good tawheed in Allah, then it drives us towards religion. We are driven. Why are you fasting in the month of Ramadan? These hours, all these hours long. Why? Because your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what's driving you to fast. Why do you wake up at like 3, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning sometimes to pray Salatul Fajr? for example, when it's in the summertime. Why do you wake up? Why not just sleep? Because your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling you. So what's important is we go through Ahlul Bayti alayhim salam so that our faith in Allah is pure, pure. Two important points and then we'll finish our discussion tonight. Make sure, brothers and sisters, you talk to your children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when they're young, speak to him. Imam Ali alayhi salam in his wasiyya to Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba al -Hasan al alayhi salam. He wrote this wasiyya to Imam al-Hasan in the year 38 after Hijrah, after the Battle of Safin. I know you guys are tired. Let's test your knowledge now. Imam al-Hasan was born in the year 3 after Hijrah. In the year 38 after Hijrah, how old is he? 35, good, alhamdulillah. Some people are with me here, good. Imam al-Hasan is 35 years old. Imam Ali is giving him a will, giving him a It is the longest written document in Nahjul Balagha from Imam Ali to someone. That and the will that, or the uh, document he gave to Malik al-Ashtar. Those two are the longest documents written by Imam Ali alayhi salam. In it, to Imam al-Hasan, he says, son, be aware that Allah is one. He has no associates. If there were associates, we'd have seen their prophets. Where are the messengers? Yani if there was a God, other, this is one of the proofs Imam Ali salam is using to prove that there is only one God. If there were other gods, we would have seen their prophets. Or we would have seen their signs of creation. All the sign of the creation is coherent. Points towards one creator. So this is his proof. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anbiya adds another evidence. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ What would have happened? لَفَسَدَتَ If there were gods other than one god, if there were multiple, then corrupt, chaos would erupt. One would say, I want winter. One would say, I want summer. One would say, I want snow. The other one would say, I want sun. There will be difference. But it's all cohesive. This means that there is one creator. See the evidences of the Quran? Just like what Imam Ali salam is using in Nahjul Balagha. Last point, inshallah, very briefly, because it's the time of Adhan, inshallah. What can we do to increase our aqidah and iman? Very One, Quran. Read Quran. The riwayah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says that these hearts, they become rusted like iron. So clean the rust with the recitation of the Qur'an. 
So read Quran regularly. Two, dua, brothers and sisters, dua. Try to read and memorize as much dua as you can. Dua al sabah Ya man dalla ala thatihi bithatih wa tanazzaha am mujanasati makhluqatih wa jalla am mulaamati kayfiyatih Ya man qaruba min khatarat al-dhunun wa ba'uda al lahazat al-uyun wa alima bima kana qabla an yakun All beautiful words of theology and tawheed Imam Ali is teaching us. Dua is very important. So constantly read dua. Third thing, brothers and sisters, Salatul Layl. Try to pray Salatul Layl. Salatul Layl, inshallah, we'll talk about it over the next few nights. 11 raka'at, especially this month of Ramadan, try to pray Salatul Layl. So that your aqidah in Allah increases. Salatul Layl gives you tawfiq, success. Unlocks keys, doors for you. So the more you can pray it, the better, as well as the nawafil. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inshallah to increase in our aqidah in him in the way that he wants and he likes inshallah so that we keep and maintain our true faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Raise your hands in the dua very quickly inshallah. We read this dua together at the time of iftar, many people have hajat, many people have asked us to remember them in our dua. Some of them are ill, some of them are in the hospitals, some of them have this cancerous disease. May Allah give them, inshallah, quick and complete recovery. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, amma yujibu al-mudtar idha da'ah wa yakshifu al-su. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك بسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم ten times together يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار مع محمد وآله الأطهار اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اقض حوائجهم شافي مرضاهم يسر أمورهم وارحمهم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وانصاره واعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كل وليك الحجه ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى ابائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح أموات المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أموات الجالسين والحاضرين والباذلين والمساهمين والمشاركين والمشاهدين على الخصوص أرواح الشهداء والعلماء رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات الله صل على